Hello and welcome. This video is made specifically for college students who are taking lower level economics courses. And I'm going to be doing is sort of a test review and some problem solutions that you might face in your exam. Now, every class is different. Every professor is different. What I'm going to be doing is going over this material that's in basic principles of economics and going through what I feel may be the most important aspects for a student to know. Also, this video is linked to a lecture video based on the same name. So if you haven't listened to the lecture material, you may want to. You can go ahead and click on that link. If not, let's go ahead and get on with this and do a sort of a looking at what might be important for you to know for your upcoming exams. As a reminder, here are the 10 basic principles of economics that was covered in lecture one or maybe covered in your class. Now I'm going to review some possible questions and answers that you re encounter by breaking this up into the three major groups. Um, I should state that most likely you're going to face mostly multiple choice, true and false, maybe a short answer an essay question for this material. There's not really a lot of math problems or graphings to be completed. For multiple choice questions, be careful that you know what is covered in each principle. If you know these titles that I've given you, that might help you determine the correct answer. But let's get looking at these groups. Often I've seen on quizzes and midterm exams, Instructors ask questions about the saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Simply remember that this means that people face trade-offs. Look for trade-offs in the answers or some type of trade-off that a person has to make, such as a person has limited money and they can only buy this or that, or a person has limited time to pick to do something and they can only do this or that. You could also see something about firms or societies that have to trade one thing for another, such as pollution for jobs. It's all about the trade-off. The other item you could see is efficiency versus equality. Quite often I see instructors make this an easy question, how you define these. So just have those definitions. I also see as a popular question, what is the difference between these two? So when we're looking for anything to do with efficiency, you want to look for words like maximizing benefits or minimizing waste for a scarce resource. And with equality, you're looking for words like uniform distribution or equal pieces of a scarce resource, equal pieces of the pie. The other thing that you may be asking and you may be having to make sure you look for is to remember which goes which direction, meaning that an increase in equality generally means there's a decrease in efficiency and vice versa. An increase in efficiency means a decrease in equality. How might we illustrate this? Well, taxes is a really common illustration type question. Meaning is they might say, we're going to increase taxes. How does that affect the community? Well, if we have higher taxes, it's generally relating to increasing equality because we're going to be sharing the services that those taxes pay for along society rules, which means that the efficiency might go down some. Now, with principle two, these questions will be no question, opportunity costs, and almost always there's a question about opportunity costs. Remember, opportunity costs is what you give up to get something else. You might find some questions here also where you might have to identify some costs. So don't forget intangible things such as the value of time. You could also find a question like this where you have to calculate something. So the key here is to see what is added and what is subtracted. In this college example, you are giving all the costs of college, but you need to add in the money that the person would have earned if they had not gone to college. So this is the opportunity cost that they did not take. But then if they didn't go to college, they would have had to have paid for room and board, which is the 5K. So while they may have earned 15,000 if they didn't go to college, they would have spent 5K anyway. So they would have only brought home 10K. So the 10K is the money that they had an opportunity to earn, but they did not. So the total answer for this would be 42K. This question will deal with the, the rational person. Yeah, don't snicker too hard. Look for answers that fit the statement that a person will take actions if the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, or they will not take action if it's the opposite. 
So when the marginal cost is higher than the marginal benefit, a person would not take that action. Also, remember, when we talk about marginal change, we're talking about a small incremental change, not huge, big sweeping change. So looking at that soup question example up there, the marginal benefit would be the benefit Steve would get from the second cup of soup because he would have already eaten the first cup of soup. Now, you should also be prepared that there could be a few calculation questions. The classic one is about seats on an airplane or a bus. The point of the question is to see if you know the difference between marginal costs and average costs. So let's break down an example using an airplane. In this first example, we can figure out the average cost of the seat is going to be $400. But remember, an average cost is not a marginal cost. Another question that you might be asked is whether or not you should sell a standby seat because after all, they have five empty seats. Now, at first you might say no because the price of $300 is, is less than the average cost. However, you have to remember that the cost of flying the plane is fixed at $40,000, whether the plane is full or not. So the marginal cost of this extra passenger would be the cost of the bag of peanuts and canned of soda, if you even get that these days on a flight. But the cost of the soda and the peanut is much less than the $300 that you would save for the ticket. You could also think of it this way. The flight is about $2,000 in the hole, but now that we have through $300 minus the $5 cost of the peanuts, you're going to have less loss. So it would be a good thing to do. Let's take a look at another question. I'm going to give you a second to take a read this and see what answer you come up with. At first, you might want to say sell the computer for $100 because he's already spent $200. And if you put another $175, the total cost would be $375 to fix the computer. So if he sells the computer, he would lose $25 if he does this extra repair. But look again, not so quick. Remember, he's already spent $200. That money's already out. So if he sells for parts at $100, he will lose $100 on this option. So it's much better off to fix the computer and lose only $25 than to lose $100. So the marginal benefit to fix is negative 25, and that's much better than the marginal benefit to sell, which would be a negative 100. Now, these tend to be questions to see if you can determine what incentive is or what action is trying to be incentivized or what effect a policy might have. You have to make sure you remove your own personal opinions on how an incentive might affect you personally. After all, your test is not written about you, but what the economics people call a reasonable person. Look for what the typical change would be. Also, the all of the above answers may actually really be a good choice, as long as all of the questions or all the answers or choices you're given would have some sort of change. Things like taxes and policies and rules are also often used to illustrate an incentive on a test question. Economists view the concept of trade as a favorable thing. Remember that these will probably be multiple choice questions and they'll be about the concept of trade, not about specific trade deals, unless your professor discussed them. Generally look for answers that say trade is good for all parties. Although sometimes students do get tricked a little on the cost of trade, in theory, trade should reduce cost for everyone. Again, remember this principle is about the concept of trade and it assumes that trade is fair. Make sure you understand that central planning economies such as communisms have been found to be less effective than market economies. You might have questions that look to see if you understand that market economies allow individuals to determine how scarce resources are used within their society. You can also see things that ask about government and that government should only step in and decide for societies when there's times of emergencies. Here I should mention Adam Smith. Many economic professors like to discuss him and if they have 
you'll probably get a couple of questions on him. Remember that Adam Smith wrote Wealth of the Nation back in 1776. He's known for his free market concepts and the concept of what he calls the invisible hand. Now, I've also seen some short answer and essay questions that will ask students to look at whether or not the Declaration of Independence and the Wealth of the Nation have anything in common. Besides when they were actually done, the answer is yes. They both tend to promote individuality and they both tend to say it's best if government minimizes guiding people's actions. Smith also discussed that free markets should leave the decisions between firms who are offering goods and services and the households that desire them. That if this is done, it will result in a good economy as long as again, government stays out of it. That people's self-interest and prices, he believed, would lead to achieving efficiencies in production because producers would only want to make what people want to buy. Questions from this principle will be dealing with government's role in keeping markets going and about prices. These questions will be looking to see if you understand that price is determined in the marketplace between buyers and sellers. Moreover, buyers will buy more of something if they can find the item below normal market price, but sellers may not want to produce at a lower price. As such, buyers and sellers must come to an agreement on price that they're both be willing to exchange at. Government's involvement in price can upset markets, however. Meaning is that if the government steps in, we could see that the demand for something could increase or the demand for something could be reduced. As an example, a dramatic increase in the price of cigarettes along with other policies has resulted in the lowering of people smoking. You might see something like what would happen if a government increased minimum pay for teachers up by 50%. You would expect the number of people wanting to teach jobs to go up. The number of job openings though might go down. You might also see the actual number of teachers reduce due to the increase in labor costs. You may also see questions that refer to the government's role in the marketplace in terms of property rights and its roles to protect these rights along with policies, laws, courts, and government agencies. Depending on the teacher, be able to identify examples also of, of externalities. Market power. These are also often asked quite often. Here, you're going to see questions about what productivity is and how it affects society. Remember that productivity is the number of goods or services that is produced from each unit of labor. Now go back to the lecture if you've forgotten what a unit of labor is. These questions will want to ensure you know that there's a direct link between the standard of living within a society and the productivity of that society. The higher the standard of living, the higher their productivity. I also tend to sometimes see questions from professors to see if you understand what was happening within your own country. When was there slow times? When were there fast times? Now I'm putting the United States on this particular video, but if you're an international student, you may wanna know what happened in your own country or look at what your textbook is talking about. You may also be asked questions where you have to come to some sort of conclusion based on the data that you're given. So what you're looking for in a question like the one you're seeing is what firm or country is producing the most effectively. So that country that produces more items in less time should have a higher standard of living. The country or firm that produces less items in that time is having basically a lower standard of living. Here's another question, and don't let these numbers intimidate you. Most often, the math in these kind of questions are really simple. After all, we're not math instructors, we're economics instructors, and we like easy numbers when it comes to math. So you can see here that this is just simply division. 
It just takes a few minutes for you to simply walk through the division. What you really want to make sure is that you look for basically what is the answer of who produced more and who produced less. So the more you make in the shorter time, the better your productivity, the better your standard of living, the less you produce, the worse your productivity, the worse your standard of living. You also may find that you have a question or two about what policymakers could do to help the productivity of their country, because after all, this is the big picture items. So think about anything that could raise or increase productivity as being a good thing. Things like increasing education, better machines, more research and developing, having the most updated technology. I mean, after all, tilling a farm with a tractor will tend to be a lot more productive than tilling a farm with a mule. Again, I often see questions about countries' times of inflation. So know your history of inflation and that's presented in your textbook. Questions from this area also tend to look to see if you know that there's a link between high growth of the quantity of money in a society and high inflation. These questions tend to be looking at historical events and long range policies. While you might have a question to an inflation, you'll more likely see questions about the effects of the money supply in society in the short term versus the long term. The things to watch out for is to understand which way the money supply is moving. Is it increasing or is it decreasing? If interest rates go up, then less people will borrow money and there'll be less money out in society to spend. If interest rates go down, there'll be more money and thus there'll be more money to spend. So think of it this way. If mortgage rates are 8% versus 4%, what would the outcome be? Well, less people would want to borrow money at 8% because it's very expensive. So there'd be less money in the community used to buy houses Thus, there might be more unemployment because there would not be so many people employed to build houses. But if the rate drops to 4%, then more people could afford mortgages. So more money would be in this community and we would have to hire more people because we would need to build more houses. This lecture kind of went over some of the questions you might expect if you have the 10 principles of economics as part of your test series. I hope this helped you. Check out the lecture that also about the subject matter and maybe some of my other videos will help you to get through your economics class. Happy studying.